pretty one, Ulysses. There it is. Hello, Booktube. I'm Sean the Book Maniac. Welcome back to my channel. Here is part one of a two part vlog that Leah of Hide and Seek and I have collaborated on on the novella The Driver's Seat by Muriel Spark. We had some scheduling problems, but I don't think that that will be obvious in the vlog that we are going to show you. But I got sick, so we postponed it a couple days, and then because of the postponement, Leah had other social commitments. So we read it on a kind of a staggered schedule, and we've kind of tried to cobble it together. Part one is basically the first half of the novel. This is actually quite a Sean heavy portion of the collaboration because Leah was busy with socializing or drinking. You can watch the video and decide which description fits best. But I promise, we both promise you that part two of this collaboration will be Leah heavy because my commentary and other Tokyo footage will only comprise about five minutes of the next video. Please stay tuned for part two of the lovely Leah. Unlike the collaboration we did last time, this one is going to be spoiler free. I make a, a reference that could be interpreted as spoilery in the second part, but I will give everybody ample warning and you can choose to fast forward. Otherwise, this is a spoiler free vlog. Please enjoy. Muriel Spark, oh my god, how gorgeously demented. Good morning, Leah. Here I am on day one of our three-day Muriel Spark, the driver's seat buddy read. I'm so stoked, especially now that I'm feeling better. We delayed it uh, for a few days because I had a sore throat, but I'm on the mend. Got some medicine working through my system, and I'm going to take you to work with me this morning. I'm off to teach uh, two hours of classes to a group of lovely seniors, Japanese senior ladies. They're a lot of fun. The, the class is in Shimokitazawa, which is not only the trendiest area in Tokyo, it's so trendy I can't believe they actually let me enter, <laughs> but with some magazine, if I can find the link, I'll put it in. The trendiest district, the trendiest neighborhood in the world. <laughs> All right, there's some Japanese English for your viewing pleasure. Life is parallel to hell, but I must maintain. So here I am with uh, The Driver's Seat by Miro Spark, this beat up copy I picked up for two bucks three weeks ago in a book haul. I have read chapter one only. Uh, today's allotment is the first three chapters, and I freaking loved it. Now I had excerpted the opening two pages or something on my book haul video, and it just carried on from there. So the, the protagonist, Lise, is such a character. She is a uh, piece of work freaking out here there and everywhere as she has a conniption or a kind of a fit n nervous fit on her last day at work before she goes on holidays we don't know yet where she's going for holidays she's just histrionic and the writing is just wonderful so then she goes home and packs and her apartment sounds fascinating I'm pretty stupid about stuff like that is that do you think that's a real architectural style oh and as an aside YouTube has the complete Elizabeth Taylor movie. I didn't click on the link. Sometimes when it says full movie, you click on it and they want you to go to another website and it's just a, a scam. But there's a couple of versions that seem like they're full length. And then she leaves in the morning and she talks to that woman, I've forgotten the name already, but Margot maybe, and says she's gonna leave the car keys. She has so many sets of keys, but she's gonna leave the car keys at the front desk. And then, oh, and, oh, so, and before that, she'd gone and bought this gaudy outfit and the sales clerk, tried to dissuade her from matching that dress with that coat and she got really huffy about that, at least did. And then so she's wearing it and she's leaving in her apartment and she goes to drop the keys off, the taxi's waiting and the porter is really mean and laughs and Lise seems unfazed. But this is my favorite sentence so far. In fact, it's not even a full sentence. Porter lady gives out the high, hacking, cough-like ancestral laugh of the streets, holding her breasts in her hands to spare them the shake-up. Oh my god, that's just wonderful. 
So I'm really enjoying it. That's all. Those are my very preliminary thoughts on chapter one. I'm curious about why is she leaving the car keys for this woman? And so what's going on and what happened? Something is alluded to that she'd had troubles at work before. So what's that about? Anyway, very curious about almost everything. So. <coughs> Two minutes left. Any questions? <laughs> no questions? See you next week. Bye bye. Okay, Leah, here I am after finishing teaching class, and you can still hear that. Poor baby sobbing in the background, and you can see maybe a few trendy people walk by. This is the trendy part of Shimokitazawa, and they actually see how much longer they let me stand here before they kick me out because I'm not trendy. Anyway, I finished reading chapter two, and what I'm most struck with about chapter two suddenly the narrator, the narration is so unsure of itself about what's going on for. Lise, or you're pronouncing it Lise, so I'll try to switch and remember Lise. Like, if you look at that first paragraph, she might be, she seems, she could be. There wasn't that lack of self-confidence or being unsure of things in the previous chapter at all. That is just fascinating. What, what is that about? What is Neurospark trying to do by making the narration so unsure of itself? Now, Lise is starting to sound like a psycho, or a certainly very screwed up person. Absolutely fascinating. And there's some heavy foreshadowing. I won't say exactly what it was, but it sure hit me over the head. Like, we know what's coming very soon. So, so I'm just finding it completely fascinating. I absolutely love it so far. And the writing is just to die for. So I notice the strange outfit she's wearing continues to be kind of central to the story. She buys books that match the colors that don't match of her dress and her coat. And the adjective lurid is used at least twice in this chapter, but hadn't been used before. So just fascinating. All right, that's it for now. I'll have more to say after I've read chapter three. Here I am at near Nakano Station, and this is a little uh, side street full of bars and stuff. I've only gone drinking here maybe twice, and I don't remember all these cool lights and fake flowers. Or, I don't know, maybe they're real. And benches, that's all new. Uh, very trendy, or oshare, as they say in Japan. Anyway, I have now finished chapter three, and I'm off to teach here at Nakano Station for the next three hours. So I thought I'd quickly wrap up the day's Vlog. Nice Japanese song playing on the speakers, eh? <laughs> oh my god! This is a freaky novel. Talk about foreshadowing at the beginning of chapter three, hey? That airport and especially that airplane ride. That was just freaking bizarre. Now, in lesser hands, I think that I would have started to wonder whether. Lisa's character was in fact not coherent, but in Muriel Sparks' hands, it's just that she is so unstable and her personality changes every two minutes. Just fascinating, and her, she was drawn to the businessman, and then, anyway, I'm not going to regurgitate the whole chapter, which is what I did earlier today, and that was kind of overkill. It's utterly fascinating the mundanity of getting your 
seat belt mixed up with the guy next to you and it to have such an ominous tone to it. We know what's coming, right? It's been foreshadowed a million times, but I'm just so engrossed in the driver's seat and I can't wait for tomorrow. Now, another one quirky little thing I noticed was when Bill, the microbiotic freak, was ta explaining yin and yang to her. Did you notice, or is it the same in your edition? Yin and yang are both capitalized, but when she repeats the phrase to him, it's lowercase. Now that was fascinating. Hey, good morning, Leah. Here I am on day two of our buddy read, and uh, I just snuck out now because it's supposed to rain all day, and it's already started spitting a little bit, so let's see if I can get through this. It'll force me to be uncharacteristically brief. I've just read half of the f chapter four, this morning. I'll finish it up easily uh, today, but just some comments because this is probably the only outdoor filming I'm going to be able to do, which is so disappointing. I have the whole day off. I wanted to sh film about three or four <laughs> booktube videos outside, but no such luck. I may not, not even be able to finish this little chat. Good lord. So again, the narrative uncertainty, it's not really dipping into Lee's and seems very uncertain of every every observation it makes of her that continues to be so interesting her experience at the hotel again it's a mix of the mundane we've all had that experience of bad service or bad hotel rooms mixed in with her just insane behavior and reactions I'm sympathizing with her one moment and in the next sentence I think she's just absolutely off her rocker. If Muriel Spark is trying to say something about identity, I think the passport is a important symbol. Don't need a master's degree in English to, to make such an observation, right? But the hotel takes it from her and they don't give it back right away. She demands it back. And then what she does with it in the taxi, again, I'm kind, I guess I'm keeping this a little bit spoiler free, so I won't say exactly what she does with it, but it's like, what? And she picks up that old lady at the taxi stand and they go off and that's kind of where I'm at. And the old lady thinks that what she's done with the, ta with the passport in the taxi is crazy. Because she said, I left my passport in the hotel. And Lee's says, it's according to your taste. This is just wild. I'm having so much fun. All right, that's it for now.
As they say in Japan, instead of cheers in Nihongo Day, Kanpai! So I have finished chapter four, and what a wild ride that was. So what? <laughs> I don't know. How is this going to end? I mean, we know what happens, but I'm not losing faith in it by any means, but will I feel satisfied by the end? Anyway, it's just <laughs> riveting. So the first thing that made me exclaim, oh, by the way, Leah, I have, for the first time in years, I have started underlining and making notes. I, had, I hadn't done that for a couple of years, so thanks to you. So the first thing that struck me in the second half of chapter four was Lee's is, and she'd done this before. She bought that paperback to match her gaudy outfit and since she holds it up she and the old lady are in the department store and at a certain point in the records section she holds her paperback well in evidence her handbag and the new zipper bag slung over her left arm just above the wrist and her hands holding up the book in front of her chest like an identification notice carried by a displaced person and she had done something bizarre like that before i don't remember it as well but maybe you do What's that about? So it's like, is there a connection between the book as a sense of her identity and the passport? Which we all know what happened with her passport. Who knows what's going to happen with it in the future? And then in the very next paragraph, she'd been listening to some hippies, listening to music in the record department. And this girl with long brown hair, this is just a stunning sentence. A girl with long brown pigtails is hopping about in front of Lee's continuing the rhythm with her elbows, her blue jeans, and apparently her mind, as a newly beheaded chicken continues for a brief time, now squawklessly, its panic career. I actually don't know what that last clause means, but it's so beautiful. It's panic career. What does that mean? But fascinating. The, pretty much the second half of this chapter is in the department store. And it's just so weird. The bathroom scene in the cubicle. What kind of gift Mrs. Fidke is going to get for her nephew. And all this cruising that Lise is doing for her man. And how confused Mrs. Fidke is about that. And then at the end, again an echo of one of the early chapters. An echo of when Lise left her apartment to go on this weird trip. And the concierge or the porter had laughed so raucously at her. Once they leave the department store, Lee's and Mrs. Fidke, and they're out on the street. And this stranger, this woman says, Dress for the carnival, says a woman, looking grossly at Lee's as she passes. And laughing as she goes her way. Laughing without possibility of restraint. 
like a stream bound to descend whatever slope lies before it. That just chilled me. What is it about mockery? What is what is what what's going on in this novel? Is ah riveting. I didn't say fantastic once this today, so that's all I got for now. Looking forward to finishing it up tomorrow. Oh my god, when life gets in the way and you just can't read. I'd like to say it was all fun, and it was all fun. It was so good. I've just had the best week catching up with old friends and dear friends and family, and it's just been amazing. Now I need to detox my liver because I personally have been on quality assurance for all the champagne here in Australia of late, but it has been wonderful. So, Sean, I apologise with my whole heart that I haven't been able to participate or like I should in this buddy read. Oh, my word. Now, the thing is, I've read other books and it's only because I didn't want to read this because I didn't have time to sit and digest and do this video. I'm halfway through. I have about 30 pages to go. I am loving it. Now, you bailed on Eleanor Oliphant is completely fine and I'm finding many parallels here. And I mean that in the aspect of I think this is what Eleanor Oliphant wanted to be. Like Eleanor, Lisa is quite a cantankerous, stubborn, awkward person. Yet with Muriel Spark and the driver's seat, you feel as though that awkwardness, that not fitting in, that brashness is serving a purpose. What is she hiding? What is she trying to achieve? I loved the way Muriel Spark planted each and every character into their social structure through their use of language. How Eleanor spoke one way, how the shop girl spoke another way, how the concierge spoke another way and their turns of phrase and their choice of language really pitted each person within their social structure and I found that to be wonderful. What I'm finding to be amazing is how modern this book feels. For a book that's almost 50 years old, it doesn't feel dated like, say, Valley of the Dolls, Jacqueline Suzanne, who was which was written at approximately the same time. And today it is like a time capsule of a bygone era. Whereas this reads more of, say, an historical fiction book set in the 70s, but written in the last couple of years. I'm finding the time walk to be wonderful. The sensation on the plane was great. Imagine choosing your own seat. Wow, I just found that to be a real time capsule of a piece in this book. I'm loving where this is going. What is going on? The momentum is driving me to keep reading. Yet I had to stop last night at page 60 because I didn't want to to not be able to film this video this morning. And if I knew, if I read the whole thing, I wouldn't know where we were going. But really, this is wonderful. I'm sorry I'm falling behind and being hopeless with this buddy read, but please stick with me. I will finish tomorrow and have my final video then. But amazing book and I'm just gushing like a teenage girl. Have a fabulous day.